and welcome mindsets this session of spring school learn extra hope you guys are ready you've got your pens pads out and you're going to be making notes i'm ty and i'm here with aslam who's going to be taking us to today's lesson how are you doing aslam great ty good good, so good. It's a good day it does it feels like a really good day yeah. mm, so what are we doing today today we're doing evolution oh, learners right. have gone through the first part the second part mm -hmm. Now we're dealing with the questions. All right, awesome. So while you make your way across the board, mindset is you know the drill. By now, you need to get onto the Facebook page and get chatting to me. But don't forget, it's spring school, so we have awesome, awesome giveaways. So I have this awesome Tiger giveaway and this Mikasa and this Electro CD from Soul Candy and from Universal Music. So mindset is also there's these awesome, awesome winter school books for you guys to study. It will help you guys. Spring school, winter school, what am I saying? And guys, also here is an awesome mindset. Instead of t-shirt, guys, like, uh, you know, I already have one, so I'm trying to give them away so you can be matching like us, you know, but yes, you need to get onto the page, but more specifically, you need to try and get onto the events page. That page, then you go to the competition question and go into the comments and post there, but do not forget the code. Right now, we can actually go through that competition question. So, Aslam? Let's see that question. Thank you, Ty. I can't see how you can talk about winter on the weather that we're getting at the I moment. I know, it's sizzling hot. I'm just like crazy. But you see, my brain's plus. fried. <laughs> 30 plus, yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Mindsetters. And uh, the competition question, very simple question, guys. And post them and don't forget, you've got to put the code. Who discovered the fossil called the town child? A, Raymond Dart. B, Robert Broom. Or C, Ronald J. Clark. Which one of those scientists? Mm -hmm. have discovered the town child. All right, so mindset is, you saw the challenge question, so make sure your eyes are peeled because it will be coming up during the ad breaks as well, so do not disappear. But also, you can enter on four different ways. You can either email us at win at learn extra, or you can SMS in on 083 448 8810. Write that down, 083 448 8810. You can also enter via pep text. And on the Facebook page. So, guys, there's so many ways to win. All you have to do is post. Send us those questions. And do not forget today's code. You have to remember to add that on. Today's code is, there one, it is, one. 1508. Make sure you write that down, 1508, and post with your answer. But for now, this is where we continue with the rest of the show. Aslam, take it away. Great, 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 great. Uh, thank you so much. Guys, you've gone through the sections earlier today just to remind you what this section is all about. This has been our pattern throughout our sessions now to show you what you need to know firstly. And just to go very quickly through it because you've gone through it with different uh, learning material earlier. When we're looking at evolution, it's broken down into several small packets. The first of which is the origin of idea about origins. Lots of words in there. And before that, guys, you also need to know the definitions. And the definitions is not a section on its own. The definitions pervades the whole section. In other words, throughout this section of evolution, there's lots of words that you need to learn. And the best way you can do that is jot down the new words as you're going along. Make your own vocabulary because these words can be tested in the multiple choice questions. They can be tested in the multiple matching or the correct biological term. Anywhere there it could be. Further in section B or section C for that matter, you could be asked to differentiate between terms or to define terms. So make sure you learn your terms. Then we go into the story here that they're talking about the origin about ideas. Where does it come from? And here we're looking at these scientists mainly. These scientists here, Erasmus Darwin, Alfred Wallace, Charles Darwin, and obviously Lamarck. Further to that, we must also go into more detail with the story of natural selection by Charles Darwin. In this section also, they like to ask questions on the differences between the theories of Lamarck and Charles Darwin especially. And in doing that, it's not always a question where they say, talk about Lamarck, talk about Darwin. No, no, no. They can give you any example and then ask you to explain it in terms of what Lamarck would have said and then how Darwin would have said that, or the other way around. Further than that, we go further, natural selection, formation of new species, or what we call speciation. 
And then we look at the evidence for evolution. Now you must remember uh, that the evidence for evolution you have learned over three years, grade 10, grade 11, and grade 12. You need to learn the story there. And here we're talking about the fossil record. That's grade 10 work. Uh, also, the modification by descent, that means homology, analogy, uh, vestigial structures, etc. You learn that in grade 11. Biogeography, also in grade 11. And genetics, you're learning, you've learned this year in grade 12. We must also look at a variation and what causes variation. Now, in this particular paper one, guys, the story about variation starts already at DNA level. So you've learned about variation throughout the chapter. Now you're putting them all together in this section, and you're talking about how variation leads to evolution, according to scientists. You move a little further. Then we move to the section on human evolution. And this section starts by talking about primates and our place in this story here. Also, how we are similar to all other primates and how we are different to other primates. It then goes further into the discovery of the different fossils throughout the world. And if you learned your work properly, you'll see that most of those discoveries were made in some part of Africa. So we're looking at Taung Child, Lucy, Mrs. Pless, and all the others that you talk about, all the Australopithecines that you talk about, and you're going to discuss them there. Further to that, we move to another section called Evolution in Present Times. And this talks about how scientists are using uh, the development of resistance in pesticides, I mean, sorry, in pests against pesticides, in uh, bacteria against antibiotics, and that type of stuff that's happening in current, that they think this is evidence of evolution taking place currently. Lastly, they look at alternative explanations. And the two they look there is the creationism, creationism and uh, the intelligent design. And when you do this, you also do a small section on arguments against evolution. And that, guys, in a nutshell, is this section. So break it up into these small units. Learn one unit at a time. Look for questions that you can find in the past papers. Answer those questions. Where you're having a problem, go back to the text or your friend or on the Facebook page, talk to each other, whichever way, go to your teacher and sort out that difficulty you're having and go back and try that question again. And then try other questions as well in that section. We go straight into question time. This one here is adapted from the additional exemplar, uh, 2008, question 1.4. They gave you a paragraph here. And again, guys, remember what we've been saying all the time. Whenever you get a, some sort of source material, whether it's text, whether it's a graph, whether it's a diagram, remember that this material that you're seeing in front of you is part of the question, so you have to read it. In this case here, we'll read this one quick, quickly. In 1831, Charles Darwin set out on a trip around the world in the HMS Bagel. At the Cape Verde Islands, he saw the fossil remains of sea creatures in the cliffs many meters above the sea level. The unique forms of life he found on the Galapagos Islands, such as the giant tortoises, convinced him that living organisms had evolved over millions of years. He noticed that these tortoises were quite different from those found elsewhere in the world. Each island also had a distinct type of tortoise, differing in shape of the shell and mating behavior. Now, there are certain important things that we're talking about here. For a start, he talks about and the fact that these tortoises were quite different from those found elsewhere in the world. Also, in that same area, in each island, each had a distinct type of tortoise, differing 
in different ways here in the shell, in the shell and the mating behavior. The question then goes straight here to say, to explain how Darwin would have used the example of the tortoises to explain speciation. If we go back to our uh, diagram here, there's the question, it falls here. Formation of new species or speciation. This is what we're discussing in this particular question. So they want to know from you, how would Darwin have explained this? First of all, in any question on speciation, your first sentence has to say uh, that among the tortoises, there was variation. Simply put, that means the tortoises among the species of tortoises, the population that was there, there were differences among the different tortoises originally. These tortoises were together. Were together. And therefore, they could interbreed. So this was originally. And remember, this goes back to the theory that the entire earth was together, Pangea, and then it separated into the continent, eventually into the continents as we know them today. So the evolutionists, the scientists are saying that all these organisms were together, so they could interbreed. However, because of continental drift, and that's the theory that explains that the Earth split up into the different continents as we know them. Continental drift. Drift meaning moving apart. Continental of the continents. So because of continental drift, the islands broke away from the mainland. So you're not only explaining the process of speciation, you're also saying what is happening. How did it come to this point? So when they separated or broke away from the mainland, the sea, or water in this case, you can talk about, formed a geographical barrier. Big word. Simply meaning, it separated the tortoises from each other. There was a population on the mainland. There was another population on one island. There was another population on another island. They got separated from each other. And because they were separated, because of the geographical barrier, they could not interbreed. Because something was separating them. Okay? So... Notice, they could breed, interbreed. Now they can't interbreed because something separated them. So, what happened? Uh, they underwent natural selection independently. Because they were on separate areas. And why? Because conditions on different islands, in this case, were different. The type of food, the type of climate, the type of structure on the ground, above the ground, etc., was different. So they underwent natural selection independently of each other. And when this happened, they became genotypically And phenotypically. Now, where does this come from? These two words, where do they come from? From your study of genetics. Genotype is the genetic makeup of the individual. Phenotype is the outward appearance, or rather the manifestation of this genotype. In other words, if I am homozygous for brown eyes, that's my genotype. 
But the fact that you can see my eyes and they're brown, if they were brown, that was, if they are brown or were brown, then my phenotype for eye color is brown. But my genotype is either homozygous for brown or heterozygous for brown. So they became genotypically, gene, genes changed, and phenotypically different from each other. And because of this, even if the barrier is removed, they won't be able to interbreed. Because now look, why? Let's go back up. We said they could interbreed because they were together. Then we said, no, now they can't interbreed because they were separated. Now we're saying even if the barrier is removed, that means even if they get back together, they still can't interbreed now because of reproductive isolating mechanisms. Big word again, simply meaning that they mating ideas, or rather the mating behavior has changed. Reproductive isolating mechanism, isolate to separate. Reproductive, something about the reproduction. So it could be examples of reproductive isolating mechanisms, different breeding seasons. That means they breed in different seasons. So when this one is mating, that one doesn't mate. So even if they got together, they will not mate at that time. Or uh, they, 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 their structure has become so different that they do not even recognize each other of the same species, therefore they will not mate with each other. Or uh, their mating organs have become so different that they do not fit into each other. Or these are all prezygotic, that means before fertilization takes place. Or we can get postzygotic. Postzygotic meaning mating takes, the, the, the actual uh, sexual intercourse takes place, but and fertilization even takes place post-zygotic. That means a zygote has formed, but after that something happens. Either uh, the, there's a natural abortion of uh, the fertilized embryo, it's going to be discarded, or inviability of that. Even if it's born, it doesn't live long and it dies. Or sterility of the offspring. In other words, uh, that offspring that comes of these two different species, uh, that offspring is infertile, sterile, Fertile, opposite word. Fertile meaning they can fertilize. And sterile meaning the opposite. Okay? That means they, they're shooting blanks, in other words. Okay? So in that case, we talk about uh, the, 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 the offspring being infertile. T typical example, a horse and a donkey, they can mate, they produce an offspring, called uh, the mule, the mule itself cannot produce more mules. So in this case, that's what happens there. And we say they are now new species. And this is known as allopatric speciation. Why? Because there was a geographical barrier. If there's no geographical barrier, then we will talk about sympatric speciation. So the answer would be very similar, but it will change here where we're talking about this barrier that came between them. And then you're going to bring your reproductive isolating mechanisms right to the top, because they are together, they are in the same area, but reproductive isolating mechanisms prevents them from mating with each other. So, and then you'll carry on with the rest, genotypical uh, phenotype difference and so on. But notice, guys, look at the way that we're setting this answer. Variation, could interbreed, can't interbreed, etc. And we're moving down the line in that way. Any questions on your side, Ty? Mm, not quite, but I think we might need to go for an ad break. Let's go mm. for that break. All right, so mindset is... Yes, I cannot stress enough. Make sure you guys keep posting on the competition question. Guys, I have this awesome Tiger CD to give away and this Mikasa and this Electro CD to give away. 
and these awesome spring school books. I get it. I need to get it right this time. <laughs> spring school books and this T-shirt. So mindset is keep on posting, keep on posting. But do not forget, we're still doing a lesson. So make sure you get your questions in if you're lost anywhere, if you need help. But don't forget to also keep your eyes peeled during the ad break so do not disappear. We'll see you soon. Welcome back, Mindsetters. Hope you had a nice little break there. And as I always say, I hope you went and did whatever you had to do that you're now back, you're focused, you're ready, you've got your pens, pads out, and you're going to be making notes. Again, I repeat, Mindsetters, make sure you keep on posting so you can win these awesome, awesome prizes. Get those answers in. Don't forget the code, though, otherwise it doesn't count. And don't forget you can win. You can enter via the email, win at Learn Extra. You can SMS. And you can also make sure that you post on the Facebook page and on Peptex. So to greaten your chances, make sure you post on multiple platforms. But for now, this is where we continue with the rest of the show. So, Aslam, take it away. Thanks, Ty. We move on to a question from the 2009 Paper 2. Remember, uh, up to 2010. Uh, the paper two had the evolution. So if you're looking for past papers and you're looking for evolution, up to 2010, that means 2008, 2009, 2010, you look for paper two. However, from 2011, that's last year, and this year, you look for paper one because the evolution is now in paper one for full-time candidates, okay? For part-time candidates who are repeating from 2010, it's a different matter. So we're taking this question here. Describe how each of the following contributes to genotype variation. So obviously, I don't have to go back to the first screen. Obviously, when we're talking about evolution now, we are talking about variation and the causes of variation. And they want to know how do each of the following. This was a straightforward level one recall question. They're giving you the topic. They're asking you to explain each one of them. So saying describe, sorry, the word is describe, but obviously you have to go into detail. Sexual uh, reproduction. Obviously, from your knowledge on paper two stuff on reproduction, the differences between sexual and asexual reproduction, you would have known, you, you, you would know, without the textbook and without everything else, that for sexual reproduction to take place, we need two individuals. You know this already, obviously. I don't have to teach you that. And since two individuals are involved, obviously there would be exchange of uh, gay meats, sex cells. So this in itself, obviously, this exchange of gay meats in itself, obviously, because you're taking from one person, you're mixing with another person, that in itself brings about a variety. That's the first thing, the fact that you are mixing gay meats. Secondly, you talk about a random fertilization. A random fertilization. A random meaning there's no guarantee which sperm is going to fertilize which egg. There's no guarantee about that. So therefore, it's a random. And because of this random, it brings about variety as well. So that's the first one. The second one is meiosis. In meiosis, we talk about two things as well. We talk about crossing over of homologous chromosomes crossing over takes place. You know this from meiosis. And when this happens, there is an exchange of what? Of genetic material. And this brings about variation. And we talk of the random assortment of chromosomes. Random assortment of chromosomes, if you remember your work, metaphase, the homologous chromosomes are lying at the equator. Uh, there is no fixed pattern in which those chromosomes lie at the equator. Anyone could be on either side. Anyone could be left, right, 
or center, so that when they separate, uh, there is no guarantee which particular chromosome or which characteristic with that chromosome is going to be in which sperm or in which egg. This in itself brings about variation. Remember, you do not have to mention the word metaphase 1 and anaphase and prophase, etc. Uh, these are not required in the syllabus. But I feel, as I told you before, that to explain it, for example, when talking about cro crossing over, we talk about prophase 1. And when you talk about random assortment of chromosomes, we talk about metaphase one. So we're saying that these chromosomes, when they lie, I'm just going to draw here, when they lie at the equator, homologous chromosome, there's no guarantee which one, if we call this one, two, three, four. These four, obviously one and three can't be lying next to each other because they're not homologous. These are homologous chromosomes and these are others. But these two could be on that side, these two, three and four, oops, <laughs> running all over the show. Three and four could be on that side, and one and two could be on that side. Four could be on top, and three could be at the bottom. Two could be on top, and one could be at the bottom. So there's a lots of probabilities in, in the way in which these chromosomes can lie at the equator, and hence, when they separate and they move to opposite poles, they would be going in different ways, and this brings about variation. I always tell the pupils, Remember, it's not the correct answer that's important. It's how we're getting to this answer that is important. So the explanation behind the answer is more important than the answer itself. Don't just take a study guide, look at the question, look at the answer and say, I've got it. That's not how it works. Why is this the answer? And why is something else not an answer? For example, in multiple choice questions, etc. The last one here is mutation. Obviously, you have to explain what's a mutation. Any change in the gene or the sequence gene or DNA by the way or in the sequence of the nitrogenous basis is a mutation that's the first thing so obviously if this changes, if the sequence changes, uh, then obviously that is going to change the gamete eventually. And then the gamete will pass this change on to the offspring. Now we must be careful here. There are two types of uh, the mutations here. One is, takes place in the somatic cells the ordinary cells. If this mutation takes place in an ordinary cell, like in the cells of your hair, or in the cells of your nails, or your fingers, or your toes, then obviously that particular change would not be passed on to your offspring, because you do not pass on somatic cells to your offspring. It's not the somatic cells that fertilize. It's the gonosomes that are found, the chromosomes that are found on the gametes uh, that are actually transferred to the offspring. And if there's a mutation on those ones, uh, then they would then be transferred to the offspring. So be careful there with that story there as well. So that covers us on that question. Uh, the next question is very similar to that. We'll just go through some of it. And it gives you a flow chart. There's a flow chart there. They're telling you meiosis, then there's something happening there, crossing over during a phase A, random B, uh, C is this thing, something is missing there, D, some type of mutation, E, some type of mutation again. 2.1, name the process labeled C that is a source of gen genotypic variation. So he's talking about variation still. One is meiosis, one is mutation, we discussed another one. Fusion of many types of sperm cells and egg cells can produce many different types of offspring. Here we are talking about a random fertilization, fusion of many types of sperm cells, etc. That is C. A, we don't have to know this, this would be prophase. Remember, you don't have to know that anymore. B would be metaphase. D, alteration of the sequence of nitrogens based on DNA. D would be a gene mutation. 
and E, extra chromosomes, etc. This is a chromosomal mutation. Okay, the question continues. They've given you that. I've labeled it for you. I've labeled that also for you, so that's done. Describe how the process labeled F can lead to the formation of a new species of plants. One or more sets of chromosomes are added, F. One or more sets of chromosomes are added. Not one chromosome, but a whole set. And when we talk of a set of chromosomes, then we are talking about polyploidy. And this does not belong to meiosis, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> it does not belong to evolution, it belongs to meiosis. But it is related to evolution in the sense that it brings about a change and evolution. Organisms evolve because of this so-called mistake in meiosis. And the mistake that we are talking about here is when chromosomes do not completely separate, a whole set of chromosomes do not separate during anaphase of meiosis I or meiosis II. The chromosomes move together. So one gay meat ends up with diploid number of chromosomes. And if it fertilizes, if the uh, gay meat has diploid, that means 2N, and if it fertilizes a haploid, 2 plus 1 equals 3. If it fertilizes a diploid, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Tetraploid, octoploid, 4 plus 4 is 8. Octoploid, and so on and so on. So what happens? These organisms evolve. They are not the same, they do not have the same chromosome number as the original parent. So obviously they're going to be different from the parent in different ways. They may share some characteristics, but they will be different in other ways. So that's what polyploidy is all about, and that is how polyploidy is linked to evolution. State what is meant by each of the following. Lethal, guys, you should know this is straightforward English. Lethal means to kill something that is going to kill you. Lethal mutation is a harmful mutation leading to the death of the organism. A neutral, if your car is in neutral, it won't move, unless obviously you are rolling down the hill, but it wouldn't move when you press the accelerator. So neutral here, or if you stay neutral, you're not taking anybody's part. So a neutral mutation has no effect on the organism. And a fixed mutation is usually a beneficial mutation. Beneficial in that it is so good for this organism that all the organs that do not have it die. And therefore, this mutation is fixed now on this organism. It stays there. It's fixed means it is there permanently because it was an advantage to this organism to have this mutation. And therefore, it outcompetes those that do not have the mutation. And therefore, they live and the others die. One mark each there, three marks. This one here, from March 2012, question uh, paper 1, 1 1.4. The diagram below represents a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree. While we're talking about that, those are the words that you can use for a genetic tree that shows the relationship between organisms. It's either a cladogram or a clad diagram or a phylogenetic tree. You cannot use the words family tree. It will be marked incorrect. Showing primate evolution, the letters A to E indicate the characteristics which are shared by the different species of primates which follow the letter. The point where various species of primates differ from each other is indicated by the branching off or split into new species. So there you have your diagram, your clear diagram. They're giving you letter A, B, C, D, E. These are all the primates. <coughs> they say which letter represents a common characteristic of all primates. 
of all primates. That means one, two, three, four, five, six. All would have had it. Can it be E? No, because all of these guys didn't have it. Can it be D? No, because these guys didn't have it. Can it be C? These guys didn't have it. Can it be B? This, this guy didn't have it. So therefore, your answer is A, because all primates evolved from that according to this diagram. So it's the answer would be A. Still carrying on with that. List three structural characteristics represented by the letter name in question 1.4. 4.1. In other words, just A, what could it be that all primates share? Now, guys, what are they testing you? That's the first thing when you come to human evolution. Characteristics shared by all primates. The next section is how humans are different from other primates. So here you're going to talk about the characteristics that we share with them. So the first one would be obviously a larger brain. Another one would be bipedalism. Another one would be <clears throat> that the areas in the brain dealing with uh, smell and touch are reduced. And another one, areas in the brain dealing with sight and hearing are enlarged. So that's just four that we're giving you here. Guys, that brings us to the end of this particular question, dealing with the characteristics that we share with other primates. So all primates would share this. I'm sure you've had a whole mouthful or a brainful talking about brain, brains. We now will have to go for a break time. All right. So mindset is, I hope, I hope. By the way, I just want to say thank you so much for you, those guys who are still participating in the lesson. Keep on posting your questions. I'll be going through them now. We'll probably tackle them in the last segment of the show. But yes, mindset is keep on posting. The competition is almost closing. So make sure you get your answers in. Post as many times as you want. And make sure the code is attached to your answer. But for now, we're going to see you after the sad break. And welcome back, Mindsetters. I just want to say, I'm, I'm hoping you guys are frantically getting those messages in because, as I said before, the competition will be closing very, very soon. So keep on posting, keep on posting. But do not forget to also make sure that you guys keep on sending in your questions. Like, we actually have a couple of questions that came in, Nazam. So, Shikash wanted to find out what does the term phylogenetic mean? Phylogenetic. Let's just go to our question for a start. The diagram below represents a cladogram, phylogenetic tree, showing primate evolution. So a phylogenetic tree, phylo, coming from phylum, group, genetic, the similarities or differences in that. So we're talking about a diagram that shows the relationship, the evolutionary relationship between uh, different organisms. In other words, remember evolutionists use this from the beginning of time. You can use a phylogenetic tree to show from bacteria to man the different stages and the similarities and the differences where the branches took place, where we branched off to be different from others and where others remain the, the same in that line. All right. Then we had another one from Whitney. I'm assuming she or he wanted to find out. Um, Aslam, can you, can you explain evidence of evolution for molecular biology and genetics? Okay. Uh, evidence, f evidence from molecular biology. Okay, we haven't touched on that, so let's go that route. Evidence, we're looking at evidence of evolution from molecular biology. Also, this thing can be called biochemistry. It's another name for this evidence that we are talking about. Remember, we have different types of evidence. We have paleontological uh, fossil evidence. We've got anatomical differences. We've got biogeography. 
and we used to talk about embryology. It's not discussed anymore in grade 12 level. So here we're talking about biochemistry or molecular biology. Molecular biology is talking about molecules. So first of all, they talk about a DNA. The first one is DNA. And that's easy because DNA we all study. They saying, scientists are saying, that all DNA in all organisms has the same structure. Now, Ty, I need your help here. Mm -hmm. You and I are attorneys. Okay. I'm a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. You're a defense attorney. All righty. That guy there, you see that guy standing mm -hmm. there? He is accused of murder. All right. Okay. So I'm the prosecutor. You are the defense attorney. What is your job? My job is to defend his rights. All right. And mm -hmm. in defending his rights, you're going to prove his? Innocence. To do that, you will have to present? Evidence. And your evidence would have to make sure that you are saying things that will make him? Not guilty. Not guilty. And my job? Is to prosecute. And therefore, I will present evidence to show that he's? Guilty. Guilty. Great. That's all I needed from you. All I right. don't need you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Guys, I'm hoping you caught my, my drift there. So why I'm talking about this evidence? Because we're talking about evidence of evolution. So an evolutionist will present evidence in what way? What is the basic premise about evolution? That all organisms were derived from other organisms. In other words, all organisms share a common ancestor. So whatever evidence they give you, the, uh, the, the, the scientists, in terms of evolution, it must go back to showing you uh, that organisms shared a common ancestor. This is the point that we're making here. So in this case here, if all DNA in all organisms have the same structure, it means they had a common Ancestors. This is what they are saying. Ancestor. Whoops. That's number one. They also looked at a respiration. They say all organisms have the same pathway. Pathway is the same in cellular respiration. It happens the same way. So therefore, again, that means they must have had a common ancestor. Notice what they're looking at. They're looking at all the chemistry that's taking place in your body. Talk of protein synthesis. Whether you're talking about protein synthesis in your body, in the cat at home, the dog at home, the bird that's flying in the tree, the tree itself, protein synthesis, will follow the same pathway. In other words, the way that protein synthesis takes place is the same. And this also points to the fact that we share a common ancestor. They even go further to say that there are certain what they call nonsense codes in DNA. And they say the nonsense codes in most organisms is the same. However, remember, you've got to keep an open mind because there's debate, as we're speaking here, there's debate against these things as well. But for our syllabus, the, when they're asking for the evidence for evolution, you have to present these things. This is what scientists say when they want to prove that evolution has taken place in terms of biochemistry or molecular biology. Hmm. Any more questions? I think that's it for now. Good, good, good. Okay, so we move on. We're still busy with that question on phylogenetic tree. Which organism is most similar to the chimpanzee? Now, you've got to look at that pathway there. Which one is closest to the chimpanzee? In this case, it would be the gibbon. It's closest to the, look at the distance between the branches. So this one is closer to uh, the chimpanzee than any other organism, including us. We are a little further away. Our branch came a little bit later, according to this diagram. And if you look at it, which two, if I, let's see if they ask the question. Let's see. I don't want to steal the show in that sense. Name any two, all right, they don't ask that. I'm going to go back to that one. Which two organisms, according to this diagram, are most closely related? Your answer has to be the gibbon and the rhesus monkey because they come from the same branch in this case, a branch of the main branch, and they come from that. So the rhesus monkey and the gibbon are the most closely related according to this diagram. I'm putting that question there just to show you what types of question you can expect in a phylogenetic tree or a clad diagram like this. 
The last question here, I think, on this one. Name two, any two structural characters of the skull, of the skull that make the organism mentioned in one, four, three, uh, different from the chimpanzee. Okay, in this case, then I'll have to turn back to my answer there. In this case here, they saying in this case here then that the human is actually more closely related to the chimpanzee in this case. Okay, because the branch, these characteristics, remember they said, uh, again, something to, to think about. When you're reading the question, read everything. Remember, they said that these letters saying that they are characteristics which are shared by the different species. So in other words, there's a difference that came about here. And whatever came here was shared here. So in this case, these two organisms are the most closely related. Uh, not most closely, but to the chimpanzee, it would be the human. Let's go to the next question there. Let's say, how is the skull of that organism, the skull of the human, how is it different from the chimpanzee? Again, another thing to remember, in a question like this where you are a little confused about your answer, notice that this question, 1.4.4, actually gives you a clue to 1.4.3. Because if you go back to the diagram, all these other skulls would be similar. The one that's different is the human compared to the rest. So obviously you need to rethink your answer and go back and check that as well. Okay? So please be careful about that. So they want to say two structures of the skull that makes the arm different from the chimpanzee. For a start, you don't have to now draw a table or anything. You're talking about this organism that you're talking about, and that is the human. First of all, we have a flatter face. They said name, not discuss. Flatter face. That's one. Uh, we also talk about less protruding. Or rather, sorry, we've already covered that with flat, flat face. We talk about uh, 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 less pronounced. Sorry, that was the word that I was thinking about earlier. Less pronounced brow ridges. talk of a jaw that's on a gentle curve. We can even talk about smaller canines. Remember we're talking of the skull. We can't talk about the hands and the rest of it. And we can also talk about uh, the foramen magnum. That's in a more forward position. Now remember, in this one here, you could get any difference between the skulls. Sometimes they give you diagrams, and in those cases, they ask you for visible differences. So you can't l say all of these things as willy-nilly as you want to. You have to look at the diagrams, and you have to look for visible differences. And no. If there's lines on the one and there's no lines on the other, or more lines on the one and less lines on the other one, that is not the visible difference that they're talking about. That could be a printing story or just the way that that particular skull is. When they're talking about this, they're talking about your knowledge on the section and how we differ from other primates. So you need to use that knowledge, not just any dot that you see on the diagram. That will not earn you any marks. Remember that. Write down the names of the organs that display the characteristic C, but not characteristic D and E. They have this characteristic, C, but they do not have D and E. Does the vervet monkey have it? Does it? No, because C came after that. So the monkey here, the capuchin monkey and the vervet monkey are out. The rhesus monkey and the gibbon and the chimpanzee and the human can be considered. But they say they do not have D and E. So anything after this is also out. Anything before that is also out. So the only organisms that share that are the rhesus monkey and the gibbon. Clear cut from there. Again, guys, you didn't need to be a rocket scientist to answer a question like this. Most of the questions are based on the diagram. 
There are a few, yes, two marks were given just now for differences. They, you cannot see that difference. You cannot talk about the similarities from here as well. But all other questions came from this diagram, so you need to read carefully. Good. That brings us to the end of that particular question. We are now moving to a question on, I won't tell you what it is. Let's see what unfolds as we're talking about it. March 2012, paper 1, question 2.1. Study the diagrams A, B, and C below that show a mechanism used to explain evolution. And there you have the diagrams A, B, C. These are cactus plants, by the way. They tell you here the structural adaptation of cacti over time. There's a time going that way. This is what was there, and this is there, and further what is happening there. Notice that there is something, there's some clues here, and as you're going, you can see the clue developing. From a comparison of pictures A and B, describe the feature of the cacti that have enabled them to survive long periods of hot, dry weather conditions. Only A and B, not all, just A and B. Look at A the, and look at B. Here there were two types of cacti growing. Those that had long roots, those that had short roots. In B, we can see only those that have long roots have survived. So describe it. What are you going to say? Long roots. That's all you had to say there. Remember, it was just one mark. And that was the only difference we could see there. Next question says, name the mechanism put forward by Darwin. In this case, you have to say Charles Darwin to explain his theory of evolution that is illustrated in this diagram. So we just had to name it. And the name is, obviously, natural selection. And use the three diagrams above to explain the mechanism mentioned in question 212, what you just said, natural selection. And notice they say you must use the diagram. What can we see already here? Diagram A. In A, we see cacti that show variety. And the variety here, to be specific, some had long roots and some had short roots, first of all. So variety. Any natural selection question, when you're answering it, you've got to start by saying that there is variety among the organisms. We have to understand this concept that there was variety. If we're talking about Darwin and we're talking about natural selection, we need to mention that according to him, organisms have this variety already. It's inherent in them. It does not develop in them. Because once you say you're adapting to it, that you had short roots and it became longer, then you're talking about lemma. So you're talking about the cacti that were very long or short there, and the environment was very hot. So those that had long were more suited. And because they were more suited, they survived. And because they survived, they could reproduce. While on the other side, those that had short roots were not suited. And if they were not suited, they would die. And if they die, they cannot reproduce, obviously. Dead men tell no tales, nor do they reproduce. OK? So they were short and not reproduced. So therefore, over several generations, this favorable gene, which gene? For long roots is passed on and eventually, what's this word now? Eventually, the population has long roots. Notice that the individual did not change, the population changed. And this is known as natural selection. We didn't have to say it here because we've named it already. With that, hand you over back to time. All right, mindset is, I cannot stress enough 
make sure that you guys keep on posting, 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 posting. I'm seeing a lot of you guys posting in those questions, so make sure you keep on going. Do not stop. And yes, keep on posting the answer. The competition is not yet closed yet, but we'll be closing very soon, and I'll be letting you guys know probably in the next 15 minutes or so. So make sure you get those answers in. But for now, we're going to take a quick ad break, and we'll see you after this. And welcome back, Mindsetters. Whew, I hope you have been paying attention. You haven't disappeared. You haven't wandered too far away from your TV. That you're back. You're ready. You've got your pens and pads, and you're making notes. It's so important to be making notes because these notes are going to be so important for your exams. That's why we're even doing the spring school thing in the first place. But for now, I want you to remember to make sure that you keep getting on the page. Do not forget, you can enter in multiple ways. You can email us at win at learnextra.co.za. And you can enter on the Facebook page. And you can enter via Peptex. And you can also enter via SMS. Don't forget to write this down, 083-448-8810. We're going to close the competition in the next 10 minutes. So make sure that you guys keep on posting if you want these awesome, awesome CDs. But for now, this is where we continue with the rest of the show. Oh, yeah, don't forget it. The awesome books. Why am I just punting the The awesome books as well. These are going to be helpful for you guys to study. So don't forget, and you get this T-shirt. So make sure you keep on posting. But for now, it's awesome. Take it away. Thank you, Ty. Guys, we've discussed now, just before the break, a question on natural selection. We move on now to a question uh, that falls under the section called evolution in present time. But I want you to watch how this question unfolds or how we answer the question as we go along and see if it's any different from what we've done before this. Study the diagram, prelim 2011, paper one, question 3.3 from the KZN prelim this was. Study the diagram below showing the effect of antibiotics on a bacterial infection in a human. Antibiotics have been in administered on day one and day two of a five-day course. So this patient went to the doctor. The doctor said, okay, you got this infection. Uh, we need to take these tablets uh, three times a day for five days. This naughty patient only took the tablets for one day one and day two. He felt a bit better and he said, wow, I don't have to take this tablet. So bugger it, I'm shelving the rest of the tablets. This is in a nutshell, what's happening. But they give you a whole story here. Day one, before administration of the antibiotics, these were the type of bacteria that they could see there. And after the administration of the uh, antibiotics, this is what's happening there. And move on to day two. Remember, he's already taken another course, and this is what's happening in this particular case. Notice there's a difference between the bacteria labeled A and the bacteria labeled B. And as you're going along, you're seeing a little bit of A there and more B. And here you're still seeing some of A. And here you're seeing only the type B that's left over there, first of all. Which bacteria, A or B, is resistant to the antibiotics? Resistant means uh, it is not harmed by uh, the antibiotic. The antibiotic is ineffective. It's not working on this bacteria, okay? So it's resistant to the antibiotics. And obviously, you can see clearly, according to this uh, story that's coming here, it would be a bacteria B. That's a simple, straightforward question. Again, it's what you see in the diagram. We're still carrying on with the same diagram. Explain the effect that the antibiotics have on the bacteria after the first day of treatment. There's the first day of treatment. What has happened? What can you see? Uh, the, uh, the bacteria labeled A, there's some of them, are killed. Most, rather, you can't say all, most bacteria labeled A are killed by the antibiotic. While bacteria labeled B is not affected. They only asking you, explain the effect that the antibiotics have on the bacteria after the first day of treatment. That's all. 
Those are the two things that you can see in this diagram. Name the process that is represented by the arrows labeled X. In this case, what's happening here? From here to there, from there to there. What is this process that is taking place there? Obviously, there's a reproduction taking place there. Explain what would happen if the person stopped taking the antibiotics on day three. Obviously, if the person stops taking the antibiotics on day three, uh, the resistant bacteria will have time to reproduce and grow the colony. In this way, we are promoting the development of the resistant bacteria. Use the information in the diagram to explain how mosquitoes may become resistant to DDT. Notice up to now they were talking about bacteria and the diagram. Now there's a shift away from that. They're talking about how mosquitoes may become resistant to DDT. Mosquito is a pest. Oops. And DDT is a pesticide. So it kills the pests. So they want to know how would this happen. Again, what is this whole thing that's happening? When we are saying that some survive and some die, some reproduce and some cannot reproduce, what are we talking about? We are talking about natural selection, guys. So this is what I wanted you to focus on, that when we're talking about evolution in present times, it's just talking about current examples of natural selection. So when we're talking about natural selection, we will always say that among the mosquitoes, There is variation. Some are killed by DDT and others are resistant. Those that are resistant are better suited And therefore, they survive, and therefore, they reproduce. And when they reproduce, they pass on this favorable characteristic to the offspring. So what's happening over time? As time goes on, there will be more of the resistant mosquito and less of the non-resistant ones. So in effect, after time, DDT becomes ineffective, ineffective to the mosquito pests in this case. But can you see, guys, what are we doing? We're still talking about natural selection as we're going along. We can even squeeze in here somewhere that there's the variation and therefore there's competition between the mosquitoes because they are population and they need uh, uh, whatever space that they need, whatever uh, breeding grounds they need, whatever food that is available, uh, they need the space so they compete against each other. So those that are better suited, they will survive. Those that are not better suited, they will die. This is survival of the fittest. That's all we are talking about and this is natural selection. So this is what we are asking in this question. Now look at this question here. Explain in terms of microevolution how TB Bacteria strains develop resistance to antibiotics. Would our answer be very much different? 
No, we're still going to follow the same sequence that among the virus that causes tuberculosis, there would be variety. And you will move with the whole story. Then we're using the antibiotics. Some are going to die. Some will live. Those that live, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you're going to explain your answer. It's still natural selection. Look at this question. Describe how speciation occurs when a population becomes separated by a geographical barrier. This is the same type of question that we asked our first opening question on how Darwin would have explained the different tortoises on the different islands, geographical barrier. So in other words, what they're asking you to describe here is allopatric speciation. And we have dealt with that earlier on. So that's an easy question. They're saying here, the diagrams below show two species of butterfly that live in the same habitat and feed on nectar from flowers, but are phenotypically identical. Uh, the graphs show the breeding season of each species of butterfly. Now, what's, what's happening? They live in the same habitat. They are not living in different areas. They're living in the same area. Right? That's an important. But they are phenotypically identical. That means they look the same. All right? But we're saying that they are two species. And they're giving you the story there, the breeding uh, species A. You can see what's happening there. Time in months, January to May, plenty of the eggs laid per day. That will tell you that they're breeding in that time. And this one, your species B, is breeding from July, June, sorry, June to November. Number of eggs. Why are these two butterflies two different species despite being phenotypically identical? Why? Because they cannot interbreed. Now remember, we must look at the definition of speciation first. Oh, sorry, species. A species is a group, group of organisms, sorry, a group of organisms sharing similar characteristics. That's the reason why they kept on talking about the phenotype. All right? Group of sharing similar uh, characteristics that can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. So because they cannot interbreed, these ones, they cannot be considered to be the same species with that, over to Ty. Okay, mindset is, as you should know by now if you do your maths correctly, I know it's life science, but you know, you need to do some time maths here. The competition is closed. So unfortunately, if you do not post, well, unfortunately you don't get to win these awesome, awesome prizes. But right now, we're gonna be sifting through those people who have posted and we'll be sending out this awesome, awesome hamper to our winner. So mindsetters, do not forget we'll be doing this every day for the rest of the week. So do not forget to tune in every day. You can win these awesome, awesome prizes. But for now, we're going to take a quick ad break, and we'll see you after this. Make sure that you keep on chatting on the page, keep talking to us, keep letting us know what you're thinking, keep, letting, uh, keep posting your comments, keep on posting, posting, posting. Do not forget, mindset is that this is a new platform for you guys, so make sure you use it. You know the link, www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra. But for now, actually ask them, we had a couple of questions that came in. Yes, Molochadi wanted to find out, um, Ty, can you please tell them to explain about what, L what led to the formation of analogous structures? Okay, we're looking at analogous and homologous structures. Now, we do not go into details what led to it, but we talk about how they developed. When we're explaining homologous and analogous structures, uh, example would be here, homologous structure, for example, uh, the front leg, front leg of a dog and our forearm or rather our whole hand, in fact, all right? And analogous will take an insect's wing, insect's wing, 
and a bird's wing as example. Now, if we look at these two, two sets of structures, if we look at the plan of a leg, the front leg of a dog and our hand, we'll find uh, that we talk of the pendactyl limb. That means they have uh, the same plan. Where we have phalanges, they have phalanges. Where we have carpals, they have carpals. Where we have a humerus, they have a humerus, etc., etc., etc. So radius, ulna, and the rest of it. So in these two structures, they are similar. The insect wing and a bird's wing, they are very different in their structure. But as we've moved on with evolution from 2008 upwards, we don't focus on the similarity in structure or the difference in structure. We say that both are similar, both homologous and analogous are similar in structure, but in homologous, because of that same plan, we say that they share a common ancestor. That means there was one ancestor according to evolution, and this ancestor gave rise to both the dog and you and I. Okay? Whereas in analogous, we say they have different line of evolution. In other words, no common ancestry. And because they do not share common ancestors, their plan of their structures are different, even though these structures, the wing of the bird and the wing of the insect, perform the same function. But they are different in that they are, their lines of evolution are different. All right. And we had another question come in from Hamilton. He wanted to find out, will there be a point when myobacterium tuberculosis will be completely resistant to drugs? Myobacterium tuberculosis, the bacteria. Notice I said earlier about a virus. It's a bacteria that causes the tuberculosis because we cannot take antibiotic for a virus, by the way. We cannot take antibiotic for a virus because a virus is considered to be an inert, non-living thing as such. So we cannot use antibiotic, meaning anti-living thing. So myobacterium is the bacteria that causes tuberculosis. We can move in a direction towards where we get uh, bacteria. And in the sky Fi movies, we see a lot of this, that you get a bacteria that will wipe out the whole universe because we cannot, because of our stupidity in dealing with it initially and developing weapons and so on. But guys, if you read the news, if you follow medical journals, you'll find that as, ma as many as these bacteria are becoming resistant, in the same way, there's so much of research taking place. So scientists will be developing new technology, new medicine all the time as well. So whether it's going to reach that time or not, time will tell. All right. Then we have one more which came in from Whitney. You wanted to find out, or she wanted to find out. I'm not sure your AVI doesn't really tell me much, but <laughs> is, it a, is it important to write down the word survival of the fittest when answering long questions about natural selection? Good question. That if uh, Whitney wants to know whether we need to write down the word survival of the fittest in a question, a longer question, five, six mark question. Yes, it would be useful to write it, but if you write the word natural selection, then you don't have to write survival of the fittest because they are used synonymously, although they're not the same thing, but survival of the fittest was actually coined by uh, uh, Herbert Spencer, an economist, and he brought this line in and he spoke about it, and Darwin borrowed this term to use it sy synonymously with uh, natural selection. So you mm -hmm. can use it, but if the question mentions natural selection, there's no need to rewrite natural selection. If they say, explain how Darwin would have explained the phenomenon above, then obviously they're looking first for you to name the phenomenon. Whether you say natural selection or survival of the fittest, you'll get a mark for that. All right, I think that's about it. So we need to cram this next question in quickly, then we have to tackle the challenge question. Okay, we're going to go quickly to a question here saying explain what is meant by the out of Africa hypothesis because one learner has asked for that or one of our learners have asked for it. Out of Africa hypothesis states uh, that all humans developed in, or rather the Australopithecines and the uh, ancestors of humans developed in Africa and moved out to the world. The opposite to that would be the multi-regional theory, which says uh, that the organisms developed all over the world and they migrated all over the world. And our leaning, because we're from South Africa, we will lean on out-of-Africa hypothesis. There are uh, two important lines of evidence for this. One is most of the fossils 
of Australopithecines were found in Africa. Also on the same note, the oldest fossils of Australopithecines were found in Africa. So that's one line of evidence. The other line of evidence is genetic. One talks about the mitochondrial DNA, which traces back a mutation to the African Eve. So therefore, they're saying because it traces back to African Eve, then the ancestors were in Africa. And the other one is the Y, y DNA on the Y chromosome. This is passed on from male to male because the Y chromosome is only found in males and the Y chromosome does not undergo any crossing over. Therefore, no changes take place. And that too was traced back to a male ancestor in Africa. So I'm hoping that I squeeze that out of Africa hypothesis into the last couple of minutes that we had. I think so. I think so. That, will, that should work fine. All right. Right. So that will answer the question that we had earlier. Guys, that brings us to the end of our question answer series. I'm hoping that you followed as we went along. We spoke about Darwin and Lamarck. We went to uh, the evidence of evolution. Then we went to uh, speciation and natural selection, went to current, and we ended up here with the out of Africa hypothesis. We also looked at the differences between uh, humans and other primates. So we did a bit of human evolution as well. With that, I hand you over to Ty. All right. So before we wrap up, guys, we just need to challenge, well, challenge that question. Tackle that competition question. So Mr. Aslam, let's go through that one quick. So the, the winners, I'm going to announce after this. So okay. Mr. Aslam, how, what was that challenge question? Good. The question was, who discovered the fossil called the Taung child? And you know what? I had it all in my head when I started. Mm -hmm. And even I have now a worry in terms of which one is it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the answer is A, Raymond Dart. Raymond Dart is the scientist who uh, developed uh, the idea around town child. All right. So the winner goes to Rifle Motobeni. Congratulations, you win this awesome, awesome, awesome hamper. Congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. He, he entered through Peptech, so mindset as you see, entering on multiple platforms. Make sure you do not forget, remember to enter on Peptech and on Facebook and via email and via SMS to, to grade in your chances so you can win these awesome, awesome prizes. So we'll be making sure we get that stuff to you, but do not forget to message us on the Facebook page and let us know where your postal address is, your size, all that stuff. So make sure you get that in, Rifle, right? otherwise you will not get these prizes. So for me, I just want to say thank you guys for joining us today. And I want to say, remember, I'm going to post up the links so you guys can follow whatever you need to find, the schedules and notes and where you can get the, the, the spring books on the actual e on the actual. Uh, website so mindsetters make sure you tune in chat to each other if you see a mindset in trouble help them out but for now this is where i sign off and say thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time cheers <laughs>